You're watching News 25. Local coverage you can count on. News 25 is brought to you by Mountain West Lawyer, Injury Attorneys, 727-9500. Hello, and thank you for joining us here on News 25 in Ace Country Radio. I'm Unette Gentry, and we are streaming at kpvm.tv, and we're also now on Roku. It is Thursday, April 4th. And in our top story, a fire breaks out in Las Vegas overnight that's reported to have been started by a houseless person. RJ Camacho reports. At approximately 12.31 a.m. on April 3rd, the Clark County Fire Department received reports of smoke coming from a building at 2570 Bruce Street. The first crews to arrive reported witnessing heavy smoke and flames coming from a single-story commercial structure. Firefighters forced entry into the building through a fence and roll-up doors, and a second alarm was requested. The fire was reported to be burning through the roof, however, firefighters were able to contain the origin of the fire within the building. Firefighters then conducted two searches of the building and discovered that no one was inside, and the fire was completely knocked down at 1.13 a.m. According to reports, this fire was caused by a homeless person using a fire for warmth. The loss and damages is estimated to be approximately $200 and $50,000. Las Vegas Fire and Rescue provided assistance to the Clark County Fire Department during this incident, and no injuries were reported from both civilians and firefighters. And in more news out of Las Vegas, a couple is arrested after their argument results in both a shooting and one person being run over. A couple in Las Vegas has been arrested after getting into a verbal argument that resulted in both a shooting and one person being run over. This incident occurred on March 23rd when officers received a report that a couple got into an argument inside of a swap meet. According to the arrest report, D'Angelo Dixon, one of the two arrested in this incident, had commented on purchasing a light when the female, Lashante Turner, made a joke that it would be for his other home, insinuating infidelity. Dixon walked away and when Turner caught up to him, the two continued to argue until Dixon allegedly punched her in the face. Turner then ran back to her kids who were currently waiting in her car and as she drove away, she allegedly threw a drink at Dixon. According to the arrest report, Dixon then pulled out a firearm, firing approximately four rounds towards the back of Turner's vehicle. No one was reported to have been hit by the gunfire. Turner then went back in order to cuss Dixon out. However, she allegedly saw Dixon reaching for his handgun again and had feared he would shoot at her once again. According to the arrest report, out of fear, Turner closed her eyes and began to accelerate at a high rate of speed, hitting Dixon with the vehicle. After striking Dixon with the vehicle, Turner turned around in order to both render aid and call police. According to reports, Dixon sustained two broken bones, head trauma, and a broken left hand as a result of the accident. The two kids, who were both under the age of 18, are now under the custody of Child Protective Services. While both D'Angelo Dixon and Lashante Turner were arrested in this incident, the booking photo of Dixon was the only one available as of reporting. D'Angelo Dixon has been arrested under the charges of three counts of attempted murder, five counts of discharging a weapon towards an occupied structure, child abuse or neglect with a deadly weapon, domestic battery, and possessing a gun by a prohibited person. Lashante Turner was arrested under the charges of attempted murder with a deadly weapon and battery or domestic violence with a deadly weapon. Lashante Turner will not be prosecuted as the Clark County District Attorney's Office declined to do so. However, D'Angelo Dixon is to appear in court on April 17th. And turning now to national news, questions are beginning to surface about the construction company's safety precautions regarding the Franklin Scott Key Bridge that collapsed in Baltimore. Moments before the cargo ship Dolly rammed into the Francis Scott Key Bridge, urgent warnings were sent out over radios and enabled police to block traffic from getting on the bridge, resulting in lives being saved. However, these warnings were reported to have not reached the six construction workers who died in the collapse last week. The deaths of those workers have raised questions on whether the construction company had taken the proper precautions, which includes keeping a safety boat nearby, that might 
might have been able to warn them before the impact, even if it was only a few seconds beforehand. Federal regulations require that construction companies keep such boats, which are commonly referred to as skiffs, on hand whenever crews work over waterways, according to safety experts. According to reports, the construction company Bronner Builders have no indication of a rescue boat being on the water or being ready to launch when the bridge fell. Janine McCartney, who is a safety engineer for HHC Safety Engineering Services Incorporated, spoke on the matter, stating that, if you're working over a bridge like that, the standard interpretation doesn't give you an option. The skiff is required period. According to reports from Coast Guard representatives, they were unaware of any Brawner boat being in the water at the time of the collapse. Satellite images from around the time additionally show that no skiff was in the river, let alone near the bridge. It is unclear that if the workers were warned beforehand, whether or not they would have been able to survive. However, experts state that if a safety boat was present, they would have been able to utilize a marine radio and the required walkie-talkies to warn the construction workers about the Dolly's distress calls, which could have potentially given the workers a chance to act. Dennis O'Brien, who is a maritime lawyer, spoke on the matter, stating that, if there was a skiff there, it would have heard the mayday call and radioed the workers to get off the bridge. There needs to be an investigation into whether the skiff was there and, if not, why it wasn't. And don't grab that remote. There's much more local, national, and international news just ahead here on News 25. You're watching News 25. Local coverage you can count on. This segment of the news is brought to you by Harumph's United Rentals. From home to job site, they have all your equipment needs. Call 775-990-4260. Welcome back to News 25. Well, Nevada's campaign season is in full swing, and Las Vegas correspondent Maria Sinters now joins us with more. As the American campaign season heats up across the continental United States and beyond, proud patriot and Latino Al Rojas is running for assembly seat District 12. I had the opportunity to speak to Mr. Rojas about why he's so passionate about American values and the criminal justice system here in Clark County. I believe that Clark County has a bright and safe future because I came from Irvine, California. Okay, that's the safest city in the country for 18 years. And the formula is simple. Support the community, should, community leaders should support law enforcement and elected officials at the state, county, city, DA and judges have to um, work together to support law enforcement and that makes you the safest city in the country. It's a very simple formula. Clark County Assembly District 12 is comprised of Lake Las Vegas, North Henderson and Sunrise Manor. Not only are you a proud patriot, but you're a proud Latino American. Why are you running for office? You know, Ronald Reagan said Latinos are Republicans, but they don't know it yet because of our values, family, God, job, security, freedom, capitalism, education. That's what our party stands for, the Republican Party, and that's why Latinos are coming. And I'm sending that message that we have a, a lot better to offer than the Democrats. You come with us, you're going to be prosperous. Al Rojas is a retired electronics and software engineer and a six-year resident of the Silver State. You can go to my website, alrojasfornevada.com, and my telephone number is there, 714-905-2673. I will be more than happy to come to you, talk to you, uh, I'm give you a town hall, and you can see, uh, also follow me on Twitter. Reporting right here from Las Vegas, I'm Maria Centers with Southern Nevada News Network. And voting begins May 25th. And there's a warning out there for everyone about a new scam that is emerging where scammers pretend to be agents for the Social Security Administration and they're pressuring victims into meeting in person to exchange cash. 
The Social Security Administration has announced that they have received reports of an alarming scam where criminals are impersonating Social Security agents and requesting that their targets meet them in person in order to hand off cash. The Social Security Administration would like to remind the public to never exchange money or funds with any kind of individual that states that they are an agent with the Social Security Administration. They also stated in a press release that this new scam introduces an element of physical danger danger to scams that haven't existed prior. Handing over cash directly to a scam artist is a dangerous tactic that pressures individuals to pay in a specific way by using either cash or gift cards. The Social Security Administration and official government agencies do not conduct business in such a manner. Inspector General Gail Ennis went on to state that, this is the latest example of how scammers are constantly evolving their tactics to intimidate or pressure people into making hasty decisions that usually involve stealing their target's hard-earned money. While our agents are out in the field, they will not ask you for money. I urge you not to respond to these kind of requests. Should you have been a victim of this scam, you are urged to stop talking to the scammer and notify financial institutions and safeguard accounts. The Social Security Administration urges you to call the police and file a report, as well as filing a report with the FBI Internet Crime Complaint Center at IC3. Dot gov and report any Social Security-related scams to the Social Security Administration's Office of the Inspector General at oig.ssa.gov. You can also report any other types of scams to the Federal Trade Commission at ftc.gov. Make sure as well to keep a financial transaction record as well as a record of communications with the scammer for evidence. A warning now for parents about flammable PJs for children. A pajama brand for kids is having their products recalled for violating federal flammability regulations. Children's pajama and lounge dress brand Lovey and Grink has announced a recall of their clothing due to violating federal flammability regulations for kids' sleepwear. The violation poses a risk of burn injuries to children, according to the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission. The recall includes the brand's two-piece pajama sets for boys, girls, and unisex sets, as well as girls' nightgowns. These sets were sent in a multitude of prints ranging from sushi, race cars, rainbow hearts, blue gummy bears, and more. And you can see the full list on the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission's website at cpsc.gov. The U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission's issued a statement regarding the issue, stating that consumers should immediately take the recalled pajamas away from children, stop using them, and contact Lovey and Grink for a full refund. Consumers who purchase the product will be asked to destroy the garments by cutting them in half and disposing of them in accordance with local and state recycling laws. Consumers must then send a photo of the destroyed garment to recall at loveyandgrink.com. Upon receipt of the photo, consumers will be issued a full refund of the purchase price. These products were sold from September 22 through January of 2024 between the prices of $38 and $44. Currently, as of reporting, there have been no incidents of injuries so far. The recall number is 24-183. Well, yet another study shows Nevada at the bottom of the list, and this time it's not just education. Stay tuned for those details when News 25 returns. You're watching News 25. Local coverage you can count on. News 25 is brought to you by J.K. Nelson Law. Voted best of Pahrump for four years. Give them a call, 775-727-9900. News 25 is also brought to you by Gunny's Air Conditioning and Heating. New, service, and repair. Call Gunny's, 775-727-6800. Welcome back. Well, a new study shows that Nevada is ranked the worst state in the U.S. when it comes to mental health. 
According to a new study that was done by online prescription service Universal Drug Store, Nevada has been ranked as the worst state in the U.S. for mental health. This is based on several factors, such as the number of adults who are struggling with mental health, access to mental health treatment, the number of psychologists available, and more. The state was given a score of 2.06 out of 10, while the best state for mental health, being Montana, had a score of 8.06. The study shows that 22% of adults in Nevada struggle with mental health, as well as 18% of the youth having dealt with at least one depressive episode. The state with the lowest amount of adults affected by mental health was New Jersey, which only had 16%. Meanwhile, Washington dealt with the fewest amount of youths that have experienced at least one depressive episode. 58% of adults in Nevada who have mental illness were reported to have not received treatment, while 61% cannot afford care for their mental illness, according to the study. The study additionally shows that there are only eight clinical and counseling psychologists within the state of Nevada, while D.C., the state with the highest, has 57. Nevada's eight is only one number higher than the states that have the smallest amount of psychologists available, the state themselves being Alabama, Maine, Georgia, and Louisiana, which only have seven psychologists available. While Nevada may not have had the lowest on every single category, it did score the lowest across the board, resulting a score of 2.06 out of 10 and being ranked the state that is the worst for one's mental health. And now, turning back to local news, Valley Electric Association has some energy saving tips for you and members. This segment of News 25 is brought to you by Valley Electric and its family of companies focused on serving our members. We're better together. In today's world, energy efficiency isn't just a buzzword. It's a critical step towards sustainability and saving money. Let's explore some simple yet effective ways to make sure our homes are more energy efficient. First, turn off light switches when not in use. It's a small habit that can make a big difference in reducing energy consumption. Along with turning off switches, you should also unplug unused appliances or devices. These appliances can draw power even when not used. Addressing any leak faucets can also help reduce energy consumption, especially if it's a hot water leak. Similarly, ensure your well is in good working condition and there is no leaks in your water lines. Not only can leaks waste gallons of water, but they can also lead to a large unnecessary energy usage due to pump excessive cycling. Leaky doors and windows can also let precious heat escape during winter and cool air in the summer. Using weather stripping and caulking is a simple fix that can also improve your home's energy efficiency and won't break the bank. Speaking of heating, some HVAC units have heat strips. Make sure your emergency heat isn't unnecessarily activated. Heat strips can be costly to run and, if left on, can consume a lot of energy. Regularly check your thermostat settings to ensure that you are using the most efficient heat settings. Wrapping your water heater is another step towards energy efficiency. Insulating it helps maintain water temperature, reducing the workload on your water heater, and reducing its energy consumption in the process. By implementing these simple strategies from turning off switches to addressing leaks and optimizing heating, we can all play a part in conserving energy and building a more sustainable future for generations to come. Well, if you're looking for plans for this first weekend of April, you're in luck. Now here's Mikey Ruhan with your weekend road trip tip. Looking to get away this weekend? Just about an hour and a half away in Death Valley National Park? Artist Palette. Tucked behind an unzooming yellow landscape, the rainbow of Artist Palette is the highlight along the Artist Drive Scenic Loop. Here, visitors marvel at the array of colors, red, orange, yellow, blue, pink, and green, splashed across the hills. These colors are from volcanic deposits rich in compounds such as iron oxides and chlorite, which creates a rainbow effect. Stunning not only at Artist Palette, the Artist Drive Loop winds through hills carved by the erosive power of water and gives vistas of both the rugged black mountains and swirling white salt flats. While no maintained trails exist along this loop, several pullouts 
provide safe parking areas from which to explore this unique landscape on foot. Although artists strive and artist palette are beautiful any time of day, sunrise and sunset provide additional shadows and changing light, further enhancing the allure of this incredible place. News 25 Weather Cam is brought to you by Lerner and Rowe Injury Attorney's Office in Pahrump. In a wreck, need a check? Call 702-877-1500. Well, let's take a look at our Lerner and Rowe Weather Cam. Look at those horses horsing around this first week of April with the beautiful weather, but there is a wind advisory out there. Those winds are whipping. We'll take a closer look at weather after the break. News 25 weather is brought to you by Dairy Council of Nevada. Undeniably delicious, undeniably dairy. Enjoy what's real. Hi, good evening, Nevada. I'm Mike Ruhan from the Channel 25 Weather Studios and streaming at kpvm.tv and now on Roku. Check out this windy weather map. Fernley and Fallon and Carson City all tied at 49 degrees. Tonopah 56, Goldfield 67, Beatty 74 degrees, Amargosa 73, Vegas 74, out in Death Valley 82 degrees, but here in the paradise of Pahrump, our current temperature is 69 degrees. We hit a high of 71 earlier. The wind, 23 miles per hour out of the south southwest. Humidity 24%. The sun rose this morning at 625. It's going to set this evening at 708. The winds die down a little bit to 19 miles per hour. Humidity goes up to 43% as we reach a low of 39 degrees under clear skies. How's that set us up for tomorrow? Let's check out tomorrow. Temperature drop 55 degrees. We got a 35% chance of rain. Then we hit the 60s. And then look at that. Wednesday and Thursday. Welcome. 80s. Love that. Back to the desk. Here's your net. Thanks so much, Mikey. And we want to remind you to attend the College of Southern Nevada's Documentary Festival hosted by CSN's Department of Communication, my department, and we are also featuring Small Town News, that docu-series that features us here at KPVM News 25. So Friday from 5 until 8 p.m., on the North Las Vegas campus, we will be showing two documentaries. And then Saturday from noon until three, we will start with Small Town News and go to sign the show. And thanks to Charlene Gibson and Kat Brewer, who are co-chairs of that documentary committee, the committee that I'm proudly serving on to invite community members to our event. Well, that does it for this edition of News 25, and I'd like to say goodbye to my mom, who has been here helping me through my eye surgery. She's been my designated driver. So thanks to her, and good luck to all the drivers out there now that I'm back behind the wheel. Good night. <laughs>